We're good to go. We're ready to go for the first session called Future for Africa and Europe after COVID. I'd like to give the floor to Esther Avodi from CNBC Africa. Please, Esther. Thank you so much, uh, Valentina, for that. Uh, before I bring on my esteemed uh, panelists, let me quickly mention that this panel discussion is being broadcast live on CNBC Africa, Africa's foremost business channel broadcasting to over 48 countries on the African continent. Without further ado, allow me to introduce my esteemed panelists. I'd like to start with our speakers who are here uh, in the room with us. Uh, please welcome with me uh, Mr. Francesco Roca. Uh, he's the president, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Christian Societies. Mr. Roca, you're welcome. Uh, Thank you so much. Also joining us today is Mr. Sergio Azeni. He's the president of the International Network for SMEs. Uh, Mr. Azeni, you're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> also joining us today is Mr. Dimitri Aramopoulos. He's a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Greece and the European Commissioner for Migration, Home Affairs, and Citizenship. So going now to our guests who are joining us remotely, please welcome with me Mrs. Tiki Barnard. She's the founder and CEO of Shared Value Africa Initiative. She joins us remotely from South Africa. Ms. Barnard, thank you so much. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Also joining us is Mr. Kebo Genadeska. He's the executive director of Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, he joined, joins us remotely from uh, Accra, Ghana in West Africa. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you uh, also joining us uh, remotely. Now, the, the objective of our time today is to share new thinking, to share new perspectives for SME-driven economic development and economic cooperation between Africa and Europe, or particularly in the context of the current health, economic, and social conditions on both continents. As we know, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement has commenced. It's a big market of 1.2 billion people, 2.5 trillion uh, dollar, US dollars in GDP. So now is an excellent time for collaboration between EU and African SMEs. But like I mentioned also, they will be doing this going forward with this partnership in a post uh, COVID world. So I think that's a good place to start. And I'd like to start with Mr. Fran uh, Mr. Francesco Rocca, looking just to give us a, an update on where we are with COVID. Now, as you know, as countries navigate a post uh, COVID world, I think it's important for us to briefly just reflect uh, on the impact this pandemic has had on both uh, continents, particularly in Africa, of course, and Europe. Uh, I'd like us to start by taking stock on where we are right now. Talk to us about how strong the impact or how severe that impact has been in Africa and also what Europe and Africa can do uh, in terms of speeding up uh, vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you for the opportunity. But first of all, let me thank uh, Maurizio Casasco and the European uh, Small and Medium uh, Industries uh, Confederation and the Italian one. Uh, for uh, this opportunity, because I'm a humanitarian, so this is, should be not my place. But uh, the, the, the reality is, and this is why I'm so grateful for the opportunity, that bringing here uh, the two very simple words, uh, humanity and dignity, and how can this accompany the work of the, of the business uh, in, a, in a very delicate continent like Africa is, uh, is extremely important uh, for, uh, for my perspective. Well, I think in my, in my humble opinion uh, and watching at the, at the dynamic of the virus, uh, uh, I'm not so optimistic. I feel we are not very close to the end, especially watching the, the continent. Most will depend by the outcomes of the next uh, WTO meeting. And I don't think that we have to hide uh, behind the scenes. I think we must clean the table by many charts, uh, more, very often uh, useless. The fact is that less than 3% of the least developed countries, and most of them, unfortunately, are in that continent, are vaccinated, compared to the 48% of the world that is vaccinated. And too many hotspots are in the continent. 
So we are very far from the conclusion, uh, we do need investment, uh, and we do, need, we do need brilliant solution in the next WTO meeting uh, to find uh, the way to support the continent in coming out from the, the, the and to end the, 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 the crisis. We have uh, several uh, aspects that we are dealing with as international federation, but also all the humanitarians, uh, because uh, even uh, when vaccines arrive in Africa, still we have a lot of logistical problems. Still, we have many of them stuck in the tarmac, in the airports, because it's very difficult to reach uh, communities. So we are working. And we reached just a few days ago on a very important uh, agreement with the CDC Africa, which is what we continue to invest at community level. This is, the, this is the key. And this is the lesson learned also that we had a few years ago with Ebola working, uh, working in Africa. And I think even if the Western government uh, would have listened uh, to the experience that the African countries had in that moment, uh, could have uh, uh, avoided uh, many of the problems that we faced in the Western countries. Because uh, especially in Congo, I remember, uh, we faced the lack of trust of the community. The second pandemic, the pandemic of the fake news, is something that we experienced, uh, unfortunately, in Congo at the beginning of, uh, of the Ebola crisis. And working at community level was the key to have access and then to save, uh, to save lives. So, uh, back to the point, I think that this is the, the work that we have to do. This is work that we are trying to do in many, in, in many places, even using new technologies that are, uh, are um, helping us in staying uh, connected with the communities and, uh, and, uh, and reaching them, uh, empowering the, 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 the local communities. One of the other key words that we are starting to use, and I'm very happy about the introduction of Maurizio when he talked about the peer-to-peer -peer activities, the switch of, of, the, of the dynamic in the relation is something that we as humanitarians we are experiencing in, in terms of decolonize, decolonizing the aid. So let them empower the local community, let them empower the local actors once for all, especially in the humanitarian sector. Uh, absolutely. And, and finally, and with this I, I'm going to conclude, we have to remember another aspect that is affecting Africa. COVID is only the last one. We have to remember that unfortunately many African countries are also experiencing multiple crises at the same time. During my last visit in Ethiopia, I was in Tigray in March, so there was the locust, the drought, the conflict and the COVID, all together, all very severe. So it must be a very combined uh, and important uh, um, role of the international community to fix uh, and a complete different dialogue, uh, completely changing the, the mood on which we approach the dialogue with the continent. Uh, thank Mr. you very Rocca, much. Thank you so much. A very interesting point you raised there, especially around uh, community partnership, community collaboration to, uh, in response to the COVID-19. I'd like to circle back to you later to uh, talk to us uh, more on that. Mr. Avramopoulos, uh, as former uh, European Commissioner for Migration and Minister of Foreign Affairs in Greece, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, on related economic crisis in Africa. Uh, what will you expect in terms of migration from Africa to Europe and how can Europe work with Africa to manage the reality of human mobility as a matter of shared prosperity and opportunities and not only through the lens of security, containment and deterrence? Well, you know that uh, migration is uh, a new reality globally. Right now we are here. There are more than 450 million people around the world on the move. Europe was not prepared when the very first uncontrolled flows arrived on the shores of Italy, of Greece, of Spain. Europe was taken by surprise and they didn't know how to handle it. So between us I was the lucky one, just five months after my arrival in Brussels, to be entrusted with this very important mission to build from scratch the architecture of migration and on security on behalf of the European Union. And that's where we meet each other. Let me tell you that um, migration is an inherent future of our societies today, including, of course, uh, Africa. Many countries have been forced to look inwards in order to protect, as they say, their economies. Now, for the partnership between Africa and Europe, 
This um, evolving dynamic could affect how the, these two parts, these two regions of the world uh, relate and work together going forward. I have been traveling as commission during the last five years uh, all around Northern Africa, including the Sahel region. And I had an excellent cooperation with the leadership of these countries. But I noticed also the weaknesses of working together. Migration can be, is a development uh, issue in Africa, and we all know it. Poverty, lack of employment, opportunities, and food uh, insecurity, together with conflicts within the countries and between some of the countries in the region, caused also by political instability, are the leading push factors of migration. And unfortunately, the situation remains like this. For both Africa and Europe, uh, migration and uh, human mobility, because we live in the era of human mobility, should remain, for all of us, key priorities. However, in order to be realistic, there are still divergences. During COVID, since uh, you referred to that before, and I fully agree with what uh, Mr. Roca said, the so-called civilized world left unvaccinated the majority of the citizens of Africa. Only, if I'm not wrong, 4%, 3, 3% of the citizens of Africa are vaccinated. So this might be a big problem in the future because as soon as the pandemic is over in Europe, we understand that this will be one more factor and reason for citizens of Africa to seek a refuge for health reasons in Europe. And I'm wondering, is Europe well prepared for that? It's not only to stem the flows. It's not only to better manage the borders. It's also to be there supporting and helping these people in order to overcome these difficult moments. So, yes, COVID contributed in a significant reduce of migration towards Europe. But we must think and start working for the day after COVID. So those numbers are now uh, mounting, rising, as 2021 uh, progresses. Uh, since the pandemic may become, as I said, a significant factor, in increasing migration, including along dangerous sea routes. We are in a country that has experienced these tragedies in the past. I'm talking about Italy, but also the same is from the other side of uh, the Mediterranean in Greece. Add to this uh, vulnerability of migrants and the economic impacts, we can tell that the European Union could be facing, sorry to use this term, a perfect migratory storm in the years to come. Coronavirus, coronavirus measures reduced, as I said, immigration to Europe, but also changed the routes, altered the, the, the flows. Europe's stance has um, increasingly for the technical, I would say, security uh, center-oriented response to, to migration. Africa sees migration through a development lens. It's good to mention that the European Union was always standing uh, by Africa in terms of development, but it is not enough. Cooperation with Africa is not a charity is a moral duty that can lead to very positive practical consequences for both continents. Now, as states, 
which we all know, focus on economic recovery after the pandemic, policies and the practices on migration may shift. This could um, inform future relations between Africa and Europe. Yes, there is a cooperation between the African Union and the European Union. I have attended some of these big events, but I'm not sure that uh, this relation and this cooperation is as successful as we would expect. That's why we come now to this gathering here in Rome, and I would like once again to congratulate and thank uh, uh, the SMEs Association, the, the President, Mr. the Professor, Sposium, and also my good friend Jäger Marcus from Germany, and all the contributors, because this is a channel of practical consequences and results. It is complementary to what has been done so far between the European Union and Africa. So I think we should encourage this initiative and see something more on that. At the end of this gathering, it would be important to make a decision and make this important event a permanent institution because SMEs can contribute in opening new pathways of cooperation with the, the, the business communities of Africa and, uh, and Europe. You're absolutely right, uh, Mr. Dimitri. Uh, speaking about SMEs, I'd like to just quickly go to Mr. Uh, Azeni. At the heart of our conversation today is collaboration among European and, and African SMEs uh, as they navigate uh, a post-COVID world. But it's been said that for that collaboration to be sustainable, to be tangible, there has to be a vision, there has to be a strategy. So talk to us uh, in terms of what that strategy, what that vision should entail, and what should the key priorities uh, of, that, of that strategy entail, and where would be a good starting point? Well, I share the view of the economist who says that uh, the 21st century will be the century of Africa. Why so? In the first place, because of demography. If you don't have a dynamic demography, you don't have a dynamic economic growth. Uh, but the problem of Africa and the demography is job creation. You have to create jobs, decent jobs, to have social inclusion and political stability. But who creates jobs? Not governments who are indebted, who are overbloated with, the, with the fake employment often. Not large companies. We know that large companies all over the, uh, uh, the place are shedding jobs, are not uh, adding jobs. New sources of jobs come from entrepreneurship, new firm creation, and the development of small business. One of the main problems of Africa is that uh, small, medium-sized enterprises are, by a large extent, informal. They are informal uh, often for a matter of uh, survival. The issue is to let them grow, let them grow. And the partnership between European and African SMEs is essential. It's essential. Why? Because entrepreneurship throughout the world is spread through one fundamental mechanism, imitation, imitation. You copy someone who is doing well, 
with its own business. This process of imitation and having hundreds of European SMEs in Africa could be role models for local SMEs to imitate, to copy, and to grow. And the fact that we have this event organized by the two countries, which are the two main industrial power in Europe, Germany and Italy, and are two great manufacturing companies. Because to create jobs, you create in the first place through manufacturing. And then the services will go if there is manufacturing. We have data that show that um, forecast, I would say, that over the next 10 years, seven out of the 15 fastest growing economies in the world, half of the fastest growing economies in the world will be in Africa. Africa has a great potential. We have seen that uh, venture capital that uh, in 2019, just before the COVID, in Africa invested $1.3 billion, $1.3 billion in venture capital in Africa, which was an increase by 600% from 2015. In four years, in an increase of 600%. This is uh, a fantastic uh, a, a growth, promising, um, supported by what? By uh, examples that, uh, for instance, textile um, uh, export by some African countries have increased 1,000 times over the last uh, 10 years. Um, and so many other productions. So there is uh, there a strong potential. And, um, and there is also a great deal of innovation. And uh, this is why I think uh, this um, initiative that uh, the Italian and German confederations of SMEs uh, are promoting is so important. You're absolutely right, um, Mr. Zeni, but I'd like to circle back to you later to just flesh out that strategy a little more. And you, you've said so many things, uh, I'm talking about the potential for Af of the Africa has to offer, uh, for instance, European companies, but of course there are still issues around perception uh, that has gone on for decades, but I will circle back uh, to just for something, just for you to ponder on before I come back to you. Ms. Bernard, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Now, your organization works with African businesses, helping them to navigate the business climate, but could you just help us understand the situation in South Africa and how you propose to look forward and uh, orientate the policies for SME development? Good afternoon, Esther, and good afternoon to um, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you about um, the Africa continent. Just a step back, my name, as you said, Esther, is Tiki from, from um, the Shared Value Africa Initiative, and for those who are not familiar with the Shared Value Business Management concept, it advocates for business to address social and environmental issues through our core business. It is the way that any business should operate, create policies and practices that provide a competitive edge while ensuring that we also advance the economic and social conditions in the communities in which we operate. Consciously running businesses that focus on profit with purpose. It's about building profitable, sustainable businesses. And here I'm speaking about our SMEs but it applies to large and small businesses. So Esther, as you asked me, looking 
at the Africa continent, looking at the future of Africa after COVID, allow me to share some statistics. The unemployment rate in, in two of, of the biggest economies on the Africa continent, 4%. Very, very concerning if we look at another fact that Africa has the youngest population and by 2050, half of the world's youth will be from Africa. Our youth is our biggest asset, but it's also a ticking time bomb if we do not do something about unemployment. And that's what the previous speaker alluded to. We have to create jobs. The good news is that Africa also has the highest percentage of entrepreneurs among working age adults of any continent in the world. There's also another plus with our growing youth population and innovation. Africa is at the forefront of the digital economy. Due to lack of infrastructure, we had to find different solutions and we leapfrogged into mobile and digital world to find solutions for our many challenges in some countries. Our young entrepreneurs run their entire business on a mobile phone. However, our small enterprises still need support, support from the private sector, because it's whatever support we're getting from government is, is, is not sufficient. So we need, the private sector needs to step up and we need to support our small, medium enterprises. As shared value advocates and practitioners, moving forward, we, we don't want to relapse in a colonialism mindset and the future needs to be addressed through a totally different lens. A lens of sustainability, creating businesses that are self-sufficient, self-reliant, and that do not depend on ongoing funding and handouts. We need to ensure that our small enterprises create sustainable businesses that can create economic value and value for society and the environment, and we need to ensure just transition. I heard today about all of the support for SMEs, and I almost feel positive, but we have a long, long way to go. We need to create intelligent solutions to support our SMEs, and there is no better time than now. The AFCFCA that we, some of the, the previous speakers spoke about will have been operating for one year in January 2022. Another opportunity that can help our young businesses that want to trade across borders and find new markets. All of us here today have an enormous responsibility. As the private sector, as governments, as policymakers, as funders, as investors, we need to create opportunities and solutions to help our SMEs build back better. And that's where a business bridge between Europe and Africa can, ex can assist with supporting African SMEs to build the Africa we want. And Esther, that's what I wanted to say today because in South Africa, as far as our SMEs concerned, I heard our, our minister talk a little bit earlier on, our young people are still struggling and we need to actually come up with intelligent solutions to support our SMEs. Thank you, Esther. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm going to ask you at the end of today's conversation, uh, if you, you say you are almost uh, positive, I haven't listened to the previous speakers, so hopefully I'll ask you that question at the end of today's conversation. If you are fully positive, hopefully the answer <laughs> will be that. Let me come to you, Kebo uh, Desta. Thank you so much for your patience. Now, the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry, of which you're the executive director, represents the interests of businesses and trade associations on the continent. Could you share some insight on opportunities for collaboration and co-investment for African and EU and African and EU SMEs. Many of these SMEs, for instance, uh, have difficulty securing and establishing reliable partners, uh, marketing and distribution networks, etc. What solutions uh, should they explore? How can they, for the, S for the EU side, create value on the ground? Actually, to be part of this discussion. To come to, to, to your question, I think this 
is not something new. It's been going on for quite some time. So African businesses and European businesses have been, uh, in a way, working together for quite um, for quite some time. In fact, when you look at the figures, you would realize that um, um, Africa's largest trading partner um, uh, is the third largest uh, uh, trading partner for the EU. And um, um, EU is the top provider uh, of both assistance and trade and investment in Africa. So this is not something that um, is, as I said, new, but something that needs to be strengthened. Uh, as we speak now, we um, have, um, because of COVID, probably, but also because of uh, the uh, um, the economy, which was in a way uh, has started to slow down even before the COVID, there's been some uh, decreases in this uh, in this in this area. But the COVID is a very good opportunity, actually, for uh, both Europeans and African businesses to relaunch the um, the the relationship on new grounds. Many speakers have um, spoken about the short-term sort of difficulties, particularly relating to the COVID. Uh, we need really to um, upgrade the possibility and also the distribution of um, the vaccines across the continent. And this requires a lot of solidarity, definitely, from the Europeans but also uh, some commitments from the uh, uh, African leaders. On, uh, on the longer term, uh, as I said earlier, we need really to, um, to look at what worked and what did not work. We um, know that there is the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was signed in 2018, and a lot of businesses have um, welcomed it. But this is not again new because there have been also uh, free trade agreements in the region, particularly in, in sub, at sub-regional levels in Southern Africa, Western Africa, ECOWAS, or COMESA in Eastern Africa. Now, what uh, uh, we need to do is really to bring all these uh, free trade area into one and make the uh, uh, path for business growth much easier. So I think there are opportunities but there are also difficulties uh, which were mentioned earlier. COVID is one, but also there's a lot of, um, I would say, the spread of conflicts and terrorists in the Sahel and also now in eastern part of Africa is something to reckon with. Human trafficking is also another problem. And um, last but not least, climate change. All these areas are in one way or, uh, or another priorities for both Europe and Africa. And I think there is a lot of opportunity actually for both EU and Africa to uh, come together and, as was said earlier, come up with positive, innovative solutions. And I would say I am um, very uh, positive on all these issues because I think that uh, sitting together and looking at uh, all these issues and trying to find and uh, distinguish what is positive and what worked and what did not work is a way forward for both the uh, EU and Africa's growth and development. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Ms. Aroka, let me come back to you. As we focus on vaccinations, uh, learning more about the COVID-19, the virus itself, uh, talk to us uh, how we are preparing for the next one because we have to also you know, prepare for a future pandemic. So I'd also like to, you to just also briefly tell us uh, what the lessons we've learned so far have taught us about uh, the need for collaboration uh, in terms of future pandemics also, even for the one that we have now. Thank you, thank you very much, Esther. Um, I think in terms of, um, of lesson learned uh, and what we have to do, we have um, 
three key words, I would say, that for us, once again, as humanitarians, uh, are uh, anticipation, adaptation, and once again, I spoke before, localization. So putting at the center uh, the local actors. So now we have a lot of new technologies that can support governments uh, and, uh, and uh, humanitarian actors uh, in detecting uh, the new, uh, especially when, when we, we look uh, at, the, um, at the climate change, uh, now we can anticipate disaster. We have a lot of indicators uh, that uh, uh, we can use, and we have a lot of tools uh, that we can, we can use. It's only you try to work at community level uh, uh, once again. For me, you will uh, listen to me, the, the world community, several occasions, because it has been forgotten in too many, for too long uh, uh, the role that we can play, and this is the first lesson learned. But back to the point, uh, I think that this is, this is the key. We have a very good experience that I would like to talk about uh, in Kenya. Kenya, we have uh, an innovation uh, uh, hub that uh, is working, uh, just talking about anticipation and adaptation uh, in, uh, with the local manufacturing uh, for the essential emergency items. We perfectly know that when we respond to a disaster, uh, we, have, we need a supply chain coming from very far. And uh, too often it happens uh, that, that when the disaster strikes, uh, then the help and the support arrive from far, arrive from, uh, uh, from, uh, from other countries, while it's possible to build and be prepared uh, at local level. And this is also a, an occasion to work together, and we are doing this with the private sector, because for us also, the new way is the private sector for the humanitarian is not anymore a taboo. We have to work together. So to, to do this, to adapt uh, and uh, to innovate uh, and to anticipate, uh, we have to work hand in hand, not only with the government, uh, but, uh, but uh, with, the, with the private sector. And, uh, and third, uh, I would like to come back to the, to the to world localization, because we need to stagnate the, the, the health system in Africa. We have, we have to admit uh, that if we compare the pro capita uh, expenditure in Europe, uh, that more or less is 3,000, uh, and you compare the, 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 the pro capita expenditure pro capita in Africa, is uh, more or less uh, from 20 up to $40. So there is a huge health divide. Uh, and, uh, and we have to increase the work at community level once again. And uh, the lesson learned uh, with, uh, that has been strengthened by, by the COVID-19 uh, COVID is the community surveillance. Uh, think about, and then back once again about Congo, now in few days we are able to detect every single case of Ebola now. Why? Because we are worked at community level, empowering them, teaching them. This is, uh, and this has been the work also with the health workers, no? the innovation that Tedros brought in Ethiopia many years ago, and now has been expanded in many other countries. So we do need a different form, not to, to watch to the continent with, uh, with the Western eyes, uh, but work uh, and support uh, the African eyes, uh, uh, providing them the support that they need and they are not what they do want uh, to provide them. This is the, the, the other part, when we talk about localization. And this is also the, uh, why I was so happy even about the invitation of culture. This is a cultural shift uh, that we need to have uh, in dealing with the continent, even if you want to create new opportunities for job, new opportunities for, for, for business. So thank you for, uh, for, for your question. Thank but you once again, much, yeah. the three key words are the one that I Thank mentioned. you so much, Mr. Roca. Uh, Thank you so much. And I mean, we can take comfort from the fact that um, I think it's Moderna uh, who's thinking of uh, establishing a factory here in Africa so that you know, vaccines can be produced so that you know, we cut back on that time uh, shipping. Uh, Mr. Dimitris, let me come back to you. Which political, as Europe and Africa seek to deepen uh, ties and beyond the uh, uh, economic ties, which political acts and agreements will be needed now between Africa and Europe to improve economic cooperation between uh, both uh, continents. And some political analysts believe that one route to closer collaboration between Africa and Europe is to focus on the most urgent issues that both continents can address together. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, Europe uh, needs the courage, to find the courage to adopt a substantial new Africa policy. 
uh, we have to move from, uh, let's say, the donor recipient paradigm towards a political dialogue framework guided by the EU African Union relationship. The relationship should be more pragmatic and less rhetoric, with uh, mutual interests rather than assertions of equality privileges. Let me tell you, I want to be frank with you. Africa does not need charity, because this is the perception in some countries in Europe. It needs true, sincere, and fair relationships and partnerships. Europe needs these partnerships just as much. You know that Europe is an aging continent. The average is more than 55 years old. Europe will be in need of migrants in the future. But what I always say, and I was saying that as a European Commissioner, going against all those who wanted to see Europe behind closed borders, that is the moment to pave the way for legal migration. This is the answer. And this can be done, believe me, very, very easily. We should uh, collaborate at large scale uh, rather than on projects as some people believe in Europe, to fix major global challenges. It was mentioned before, climate change, pandemic, trade, and the future of work. Development cooperation will be needed to support the COVID-19 reset across Africa, yes. We must also adapt financial instruments and priorities to this new reality we are confronted with. Through leveraging its connection with um, regional integration and free trade, migration, I come back to that, can serve better in stimulating development and economic growth. So let's see the positive uh, side of migration. Africa and Europe design uh, their policies, as we all know, and practices migration and mobility in a collaborative, comprehensive, and a consultative uh, manner. In so, we shall ensure better migration cooperation outcomes. This is very important because we are facing this reality today. Competition now, let me go to that, between the United States and China is an opportunity for Europe to step up and build strategic partnership in Africa. Allow me to interpret uh, in a quite authentic way what I learned running the visiting countries in Africa. They would like to see more European presence there. I don't want to get into details, but we all know what is happening in Africa right now with approximately 20 million Chinese there. Chinese know how to play on the chessboard of trade, but is it beneficial for the African countries? As it was very correctly said before, Europe, Europe and Africa have strong and long-lasting cultural, historical and uh, economic relations. This is to update the basic principles upon which this partnership can be built on terms of uh, mutual cultural respect. It is, I believe, in uh, Europe's interest to no longer look at Africa as only a humanitarian case, but as a business case. And I believe that it is at the heart of this initiative undertaken today here in Rome. 
Africa can be a key supplier of skills to meet the demographic, demographic needs in Europe and fill market gaps in key sectors. Now, establishing a talent partnership with mutual benefits to both continents should establish, and this is my proposal at the end of this meeting today, a permanent institution of dialogue among stakeholders of the two continents, parallel function and complementary to EU African official talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dimitri. Very solid points you, you made there. Mr. Azani, let me come back to you. I mean, earlier you talked about all the, you know, you rolled out all the opportunities uh, that EU companies can take advantage of uh, in uh, Africa. But then we know that, as we know, Europe is Africa's biggest trading partner, but the number of SMEs, European SMEs in Africa, are very, very low. And we know that one of the, the ent common entry barriers is perception. Many European companies uh, have this erroneous idea or perception of the business climate, social uh, climate, uh, economic climate in Africa. Why has it been so difficult to address this particular challenge? I mean, you know what the challenges are. I know that many SMEs here know what the challenges are. I think it would be interesting for them to hear why, you know, this problem continues to persist. And also, we're not here to talk about problems. We're focusing on solutions also. What solutions do you propose? Well, um, what uh, Mr. Avramopoulos uh, was saying is uh, that uh, the policy for Africa has to change, uh, should not be just aid. And uh, Dambisa Moyo uh, clearly stated in a famous book that uh, charity kills. I don't go as far as Dambisa Moyo because I think that uh, charity is an expression of solidarity and so it's uh, uh, very important in terms of values, solidarity. But nevertheless, we have to move uh, the agenda to a business uh, dimension, and this is the purpose uh, of this meeting. However, we are living uh, in uh, a knowledge-based economy. The knowledge, therefore, in a knowledge-based economy, education is very important. But, the, but what sort of education? We know, for instance, that uh, Tunisia is uh, a country that has um, one of the highest literacy level in the world, not only for men, but also for women, thanks to Bourguiba. Nevertheless, the problem of unemployment in Tunisia is very high because there is a mismatch between the supply and demand of skills. What uh, I think uh, could be the great contribution of Europe, and in this sense, uh, we have Markus Jäger from Germany representing the Mittelstand. What is the key of the Mittelstand is vocational training, vocational education. The problem is that in, uh, there is uh, the, 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 the dream I remember in France, uh, one uh, uh, minister of education wanted to bring uh, all the population to university. That is not the future. That is not what is needed. What the business needs, the business demands skilled people for 
manufacturing and services for, uh, for hospitals, for not necessarily. Often in hospitals, they are lacking uh, nurses, not doctors. I, this is why the experience that a small business in manufacturing in Italy and Germany have in uh, uh, providing the uh, vocational training, because out, most of the SMEs in Italy that are successful are uh, made by entrepreneurs that went to vocational uh, schools, that were blue-collar workers, that have grown. So, in that sense, uh, there is uh, a, uh, a need to educate the African population, but the education should be, of course, also higher education, but most importantly, for the business purpose, for the creation of jobs, to close the gap between supply and demand of skills would be to borrow the experience that the best European SMEs in manufacturing have experienced. Because uh, we, we have to share best practice. We have to learn from what works and what doesn't. And we have uh, here, in the small business of Italy and Germany, some successful examples on how you can share through clusters, for instance, uh, of uh, experience, uh, create pools of uh, um, skills that make uh, certain industry to thrive and grow. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Azen. A very valid point that you've made there. Uh, Ms. Banner, let me come to you. Now, we were also talking earlier about uh, a vision, a strategy for an uh, SME-EU uh, collaboration. In defining that agenda, what is that one key element that you think should not be left out? I think I just, thank you for that, Esther. I just want to comment a little bit on what some of the speakers were saying as well. And I want to say, Mr. Dimitri, it's very true that Africa does not need charity. I think what we need and the key element, Esther, is that we need partnerships. Partnerships born out of respect, honesty, and trust. And I do believe that policies need to change. Because if we look at some of the policies that's been created in relation to working with Africa, those policies were drafted years ago. And, and things have changed. I mean, COVID has shown us how inextricably business and society is linked. So we have to revisit those policies. We work extensively with young entrepreneurs. We need to bring them to the table as well, because they have to be part of when we discuss these policies that we want to change. We need to include our young people, and we need to give them a place at the decision-making table, because they, and also another one of our speakers earlier on said, I believe personally that the future is being created on the Africa continent. And if we can get the support of Europe to help us to build, as I said earlier on, the Africa we want, we need the support. You know, our young people can drive it because they're here and they're present and they want to do it as well. So Esther, yeah, I think for me, the one, one big ingredient in all of this is partnerships. But partnerships that, you know, where we respect each other, there's honesty and there's trust, which we all know is a little bit of a difficult thing as well. <laughs> you know, specifically when we look at, at some of the leadership in Africa, but we need to never stop trying because we need to actually support our SMEs, and we can do it between Africa and Europe. Thank you, Esther.
Thank you very much, uh, Tiki. Mr. Uh, Mr. Kibo, I'd like you to, uh, I'm posing that same question to you just to get your own uh, input also for uh, Ms. Bernard is partnerships. What would it be for you? Obviously, partnership is, is fundamental, but what, what other perspective do you, uh, do you have? Um, that we need speed, we need scale and size um, to um, build up this partnership or to build a new type of relationship. I think we all seem to agree that the old model doesn't seem to be working. We've tried it for quite some time for, from both sides, from the EU side and from the African side. There's been a lot of discussions on this issue, but really nothing much to report. And someone has suggested also earlier, the results or the outcome has not been very, um, very visible. So one of the things that um, we need to do is not to repeat the same mistakes again and again. I think there is um, a new phenomena that has been created after COVID. There's a lot of opportunity in the continent for small businesses. And when we say small businesses, I think we need also to understand that today's small business can also go global and have gone global. So it's not just a small business. I think the nature of business itself has been transformed. In a sense, these small businesses can be global players in playing or in being part of a value chain or even in being part actually independently of any global value chain. So my, um, my take on this is probably to work on certain issues that would probably bring the two continents benefits. One is of course, the issue of peace and security, which is very much an interest for both Africans and also the Europeans. There's the issue of trade and investment, which, as it is today, it's not really very helpful to uh, small and medium enterprises. It probably favors the larger businesses and we need really to see what needs to be done in this area to support the small businesses in terms of expanding their trade scope and also the investment level. We need also to look at, the, at climate change. This is an area which is very, very important, but also an area that can change the entire economic model. And we need really to look at it from both sides, what needs to be done, not just for Africa and, and Europe, but also for the world and also for the population, for the coming population. I think I would add two more things. One is the human mobility. We've talked earlier that we need really to find a way to um, make it acceptable for people to move relatively freely from one place to another. How to do it is something that we need really to work on. And there's also the issue of education. It's been said that the type of education that are now promoted are not really helping actually businesses and are not helping the continent actually to go forward. So this is what I would say at this, at this moment. I, knew, I know that we need, as I said, to add speed to all these uh, issues, perhaps also scale it up. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Kabu, for that. Uh, Mr. Roka, let me come back to you. And also, before uh, I proceed beyond uh, Mr. Roka, I just wanted to give um, my panelists just a one or two minute uh, notification or warning. After I speak to Mr. Roka, I would like you, each one of you, to think about a question that you would like to ask any of your fellow panelists on this topic that we're discussing today. So while I engage with Mr. Roker, you can just think about it. Who do you want, is there a question you want to, for instance, Ms. Bernard, is there a question you would like to ask Mr. Azeni, for instance? Kebo, is there a question you would like to ask Mr. Dimitri, for instance? So I'd like us to just quickly think about that. So Mr. Roker, you've talked, obviously, you have really emphasized the need for locally led COVID-19 responses. But this model, how easy is it to replicate from one region or one country to another? How easy has it been in terms of the experience?
the, the, I think that uh, the, the, the lesson learned from, from uh, COVID-19 just yesterday, I had, uh, yesterday morning, I had a very interesting meeting uh, with the five North African uh, national societies, Red Crescent national societies, uh, uh, that played an important role uh, in Morocco, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, and Libya. And uh, so sharing uh, you know, best practices, uh, sharing experiences, uh, this has been the key. Uh, and has always been uh, the key, and we are increasing this, uh, uh, this way to work uh, as a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, and especially in the, in the, in the, African, uh, in the African continent. Uh, for us, uh, uh, we are uh, um, organizing a lot of seminar uh, continent-based, uh, without uh, two interferences from a complete different health system, uh, cultural background, uh, just to learn uh, at practical level how they are dealing with their own, uh, own communities, how they are engaging. Uh, these are uh, things, but also exporting uh, good, good practices. So now we have, uh, uh, for example, the, what I talked about, the community surveillances. This is happening not anymore only in Congo. It's happening in Senegal, in uh, Mozambique, uh, in Somaliland, uh, in Kenya. So we are exporting, we are trying to export uh, uh, good practices uh, uh, on these. We are uh, not watching only, only at, at COVID, uh, but also even on other aspects about the digital ID, because we are intensifying to protect the circular economy in Africa. We are intensifying the using of cash uh, that for the communities that are affected uh, uh, in the post-disaster uh, recovery, because normally you know, there are a lot of goods to arrive uh, and so very often are even not adapted to the, to the, the, to the cultural uh, and the culture of the, of the community. So we are increasing the use of cash. To do this, uh, we, must, uh, we must increase uh, uh, the, the, the use of the digital ID. And this is something uh, that we are exporting, but uh, at community level. And uh, once again, uh, this is working, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think this is the only way uh, forward. Uh, and I would like to also thank Tiki because she used a, a key word also for us, partnership. And this is uh, something uh, that uh, uh, is, is extremely important and was the reason I'm here today. Thank you very much. Before I, let, before I move on, can I just, how confident are you now that we can effectively tackle the next pandemic that hits us with all that you've seen on the ground? I will answer to you after the WTO meeting, uh, because <laughs> that, that, no, seriously. Seriously, I think that we are under-evaluating the importance of that meeting, because here, now we know what we have to know from the scientific community. But now it's about the political will and the pharmaceutical companies to identify which is the, the best solution to, to expand the administration of vaccines and, uh, and to make uh, possible or to, 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 um, uh, to block the barriers that now are, because to set up a factory for vaccines, it takes very long. So we have to admit this. But in some countries, and even in Africa, they are ready. So it's about the political will to identify the solution. And I'm not so naive uh, that I'm saying, oh, the pharmaceutical company must uh, free all the vaccines. Uh, but there are uh, practical solutions uh, can save lives uh, without blocking the business, uh, yeah. just if you want to talk. Of course, the dream is about uh, for free. But we know the reality that sometimes it's difficult, and that this is why that meeting is vital, especially for the African continent that now is suffering the most the consequences of the COVID-19. Uh, COVID so we have to, to watch, especially uh, to the general director, which is a fantastic woman, the general director of the WHO. She is very committed, she, and she told me well, during our meeting, uh, I don't want to listen to anyone that express a fruitful meeting. Because, you know, this is a something that we have when we have international, we talk about fruitful meeting. Concrete facts. You're absolutely right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going back to my earlier announcement. Who would like to go first? Bernard, I see you. I see you smiling. I don't. I don't mind. I don't mind going first. <laughs> I I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Dimitri because I think you and I agree that Africa does not need charity, but you also said, and one of our other speakers also said, we need the EU's Africa policy to change. So how simple is that? How 
quick as that? How can we look at actually working together to get that done? Is it going to take five years? Is it going to take 10 years? Because we don't have the time. We actually need to get the policy changes in place in order to, to implement what we're all talking about here today from the vaccines to the economic recovery to climate change that's affecting Africa because we're paying the price for the development world. So that's my question. How long will it take to change that, the Africa policy? I'm not saying don't give me an exact time because I know that's not possible, <laughs> but just give me an estimation. And how can we work together to make it happen quicker rather than slower? Let me tell you that we are pushed by our common needs to change mindset as soon as possible. Because all these developments in the health area, migration and everything are moving very fast. Faster than our mind. We have to get rid of the stereotypes of the past as far as the relations between Africa and the European Union is concerned. I mentioned some of these points during my remarks before. But right now we have to become, as we said, more pragmatic. We are confronted with the same challenges, with the same threats and the same problems. Yes, there are differences in the way we approach our relations, but it is up to us. And I think the initiatives should uh, be undertaken by the European uh, Union. Europe opportunity to, to, to fill the resulting gaps lies in investment that creates large-scale value-added production in Africa. Then deploy its, uh, its resources in a coordinated but strategic manner to become, I'm talking about the European Union, uh, Africa's leading growth partner. The way to do it is uh, to combine the global gateway with the European Green Deal. Developing investment projects, greening, if we can call it like this, Africa's uh, heavy industries, and developing new climate-friendly business sectors that also use the digital economy, where Europe should develop investment projects as, uh, as well. But as we said before, we have to stop staying on this donation uh, attitude uh, from the European Union towards Africa. European Union's investments in Africa needs to be large enough to create local value added uh, production that contributes to the continent's emerging green and digital uh, economies. In this way, the European Union should establish a new foundation for its uh, partnership in Africa that enhances uh, African prosperity, security and sovereignty while promoting uh, rules and business practices that are in line with European priorities and values. Couple large investments in port and rail infrastructures with an industrial base integrated into manufacturing value chains. And I will give you an example of how this can be done. Europe has done exactly that in the case, uh, in, in one case in Africa. European partnership with Rabat, Morocco, have turned Morocco into an African automotive uh, manufacturing giant. Morocco is becoming, right now, the central node in a commercial corridor that runs from West Africa to Western Europe. So let's adopt this model for the rest of the African countries. Europe can play a leading role there. And something last but not least. Europeans must understand that our historical interlocutors in the making of history for the future 
is Africa and not other parts of the world. But it is up to us to build the new architecture on our relations. And this initiative that is taking place here in Rome can play a leading role. And once again, I would like to congratulate the Confederation of SMEs of Europe, Professor Kazasko, Mr. Geiger, and you for having brought us here to discuss in a totally different way, because I have been attending meetings of the European Union with the African Union. Believe me, it, we were very good in saying ni ni nice things. But the day after, we are going back to where we were before. Today, we make a step forward. Thank you. Very well. <laughs> Very well said, uh, Mr. Dimitri. Thank you so much for that. Anyone else want to go? We have less than eight minutes, less than seven minutes. Mr. Kebo, I see your hand very briefly, and the response will be very brief, please. We're on the six minutes uh, warning right now. Mr. Kebo, over to you. Yeah, Esther, I'll, I'll let every, um, any one of the panelists answer to this. And there's one question that seemed to be lost out in this, in this debate, and that is the debt financing. A lot of African businesses are really indebted, actually. And of course, the countries are also facing similar problems. And I'm wondering, actually, if there is any suggestions, any ideas, any comments, actually, on how to address this issue, which is really um, uh, depressing the continent, particularly the businesses, the small and medium businesses. Thank you. Well, I believe the issue of uh, you just mentioned finance, and I believe that is going to be discussed uh, in finance, the session. The debt but, issue. Okay, is, is there someone else who would? I believe this is something we're going that will be discussed uh, in another uh, panel discussion today. But is there anyone here who wants to answer, Mr. Zin? Okay, go ahead. The debt issue is oh, debt. a very important one. You know that in the year 2000, there has been uh, a cancellation of debt for, the, uh, uh, for a number of uh, African countries. Uh, now there is uh, the issue of cancellation of debt uh, uh, is not so much into the agenda because uh, you can't go, go from cancellation to cancellation. But the IMF has recently issued 650 bi uh, uh, billion of um, drawing rights for precisely to address uh, um, concessional uh, uh, credit to Africa in order to relieve the debt, particularly of the, the countries that, uh, that are uh, um, low and uh, mid-income, which means a large part of Africa. Um, I think that the move by the IMF is a, a very important step forward. I think it uh, has been a bold, uh, um, action that has been taken, also one uh, billion uh, uh, dollars has been uh, uh, set aside for uh, uh, providing uh, uh, vaccines. So I think that uh, the international community is taking uh, seriously the issue of debt, debt relief. Um, Therefore, uh, um, the, that uh, cannot be the, the problem for SMEs, uh, the debt of countries as such. The problem, in my view, of SMEs development in Africa is largely due to the fact that governments are so biased towards large companies, state-owned companies. I think that everywhere governments prefer to 
negotiate with the big companies. Uh, they talk about SMEs, but uh, then they prefer, for various reasons, uh, to deal with big... Because uh, they, they see someone that makes an investment of one, creating 1,000 jobs makes the headlines. But uh, 10,000 SMEs uh, that create uh, 1 million jobs uh, don't make headlines. Politicians live out of news, follow you, the chair, the news, the news. And the news deal about large companies, not about SMEs. When we talk about cultural change, we have to change the perspective. This is why it's so important to talk about SMEs in Africa, in Europe and Africa. Because um, the media have to realize that uh, if we want a more inclusive uh, growth, if we want job creation, we have to look at SMEs Absolutely. and entrepreneurship. Therefore, uh, this uh, uh, also the OECD is, is recommending a certain restraint on the part of uh, um, large companies uh, excessively favoring uh, large companies, which uh, create uh, a distortion in the market uh, and stifles uh, the emergence and the growth of um, SMEs. Mr. So You've made very good points. I do apologize for butting in, but I'm sure that the point, uh, we have, the point has been made. Obviously, partnerships, we know that governments favor bigger companies, and that is why we're here today. We know that is why we're here today in terms of having these conversations about partnerships, SME to SME. Of course, policy will help on the part of the government. But yes, that is definitely a fantastic point you've made there. We have just 52 seconds left. Uh, so maybe I'll just pick one person to just help us round things up. What conversations, how do we take this conversation further next year when we come back here? Mr. Dubu, perhaps you'd like, us, you'd like to take that question in 20 seconds. When we come back next year, what, how do we take the conversation further? Mr. Kabu, can you hear us? No, I can, I can only say that this is a beginning and uh, hopefully I, I think we have to um, go concrete in terms of actually the recommendations or the ideas that have come up from here and then take it from there. Thank you so much and a big round of applause to my panel, my panelists for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Also, a big round of applause to the audience. You've been a fantastic audience today also. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, Tiki. Thank you, Mr. Kabul, for joining us remotely.